Hi, I'm Steven Aniston from Big School Tango and this video is an introduction video into the world of volatility. Uh, we're going to discuss how volatility can be used to tank the market and we're going to give you a general introduction into the volatility ETFs. There's another video in which we go into a greater detail about how to tank the market using volatility and how to trade volatility ETFs for profit but the purpose of this video is just to give a general introduction into these topics. Um, so let's uh, start by talking about the market. The market is the S&P 500. Uh, the S&P 500 index is an index of the biggest 500 corporations in the United States and is a widely used index to track business activity in the United States. Uh, the S&P 500 index was launched in 1957, so it has been in existence for uh, several decades and today is the most widely used and the most accepted index um, to measure market activity today. Uh, it is also the most widely used as a financial instrument. In 1983 the SPX option market was launched. In 1993 the first ETF was launched and the first ETF was the SPDR S&P 500 ETF, the SPY. Uh, and in 1997 the SPX futures market was launched. Um, just to give you an idea of how big the S&P 500 is and related instruments are, let's start by discussing the ETFs that invest in the S&P 500. The SPY, in addition to being the oldest ETF, is also the biggest ETF with uh, over 160 billion in AUM. Right? If we combine uh, the top three S&P 500 ETFs, the SPY, the IVV and the VU, we have over 260 billion invested in the S&P 500 in AUM today. Uh, just to illustrate how big that is, Let's take the next biggest ETF, that is the EFA, which is the developed market index where you can invest in uh, uh, markets of uh, Japan, Europe and other developed nations. That is at 54 billion. The VTI, which is the total stock market index, is at about 52 billion. The QQQ, which is the NASDAQ index, is at about 37 uh, billion. And the AG, which is the total bond index. ETF is at about 31 billion. So if you combine them all together, you get about 160, 170 billion in AUM, which is far smaller than the S&P 500. But the ETF universe is not the only universe where the S&P 500 is traded. There is also the SPX index futures market and the SPX options market. The SPX index futures market, uh, where the S&P 500 is traded, the ticker is ES and the notional value of a single contract there is about 50 times the SPX, so about $100,000 per contract. So if you want to make a bet, you have to put at least 100 grand. Uh, the daily volume of that market is about one and a half million contracts. Obviously this is a market where institutions primarily trade um, just because of the size of the individual contract. Uh, if you combine it all together, there's $150 billion traded daily in the SPX futures market. $150 billion. Um, the SPX options market, a notional, the notional value of a contract there is about 100 times the SPX, so about $200,000. Uh, the daily volume is about 850,000 contracts. Combine them all together, that's about $170 billion traded daily in the SPX options market. So if you combine the two markets together, you get about $320 billion traded per day, which is a massive amount of money, a mind-boggling amount of money. Um, in fact, if you compare it to individual stock issues, the, the difference will become very obvious. The SPX options market is 170 billion, the SPX futures is 150 billion, the SPX ETF get about 30 billion traded daily. The next biggest one of the individual stock issues is Apple. Apple has 6 billion dollars 
traded daily in Apple shares. Um, after Apple, you have Bank of America, which is at about two billion, and you have then uh, General Electric at about two billion. So you have a few more uh, companies that trade about a billion, and then after that, they drop off dramatically. So if you combine all of the individual stock issues in the S&P 500 itself, they're at most 20% of what the S&P 500 and related markets command on a daily basis. So 80% of uh, market activity today actually goes through the S&P 500, in, either in the form of ETF, in the form of futures, or in the form of options. As such, the SPX is really the most import, important ins financial instrument out there it's pretty much the only instrument that matters, right? If the S&P 500 goes up, all stocks go up, all individual stock issues go up. And if the SPX is in a bear market and it starts to go down, all indivi individual stock issues go down. So if you want to monitor market activity and if you want to invest, for the most part, you need to really be looking at the S&P 500. Uh, there's also other issue, uh, other reasons why you want to invest in the S&P 500 ETF. Um, there's a lot of risks with individual stocks. You know, there is a business risk. Uh, you know, the business of an individual company may not do so well if they had a popular product. All of a sudden, it's not as popular anymore. You know, BlackBerry, anybody. Um, you also have economic risks. Some some stocks do not do so well. Uh, when the economy is in recession. Uh, there's also litigation risk. Some companies can get sued for environmental reasons or for other reasons, you know, consumer protection reasons. Uh, there's also sentiment risk. Sometimes the market doesn't seem to value company uh, the way you think it should value them. You know, they traded a lower P multiple than they should or they traded a higher P multiple than they should. There's also capital structure risk. Some uh, companies, even though they make a lot of money, uh, they have, they're very leveraged, they have large debts, and if their cash flows start to get hurt, all of a sudden the stock price starts to go down dramatically, simply because they have too much debt outstanding and cannot service their debt payment. More recent examples of this is Freeport Mark Moran, which has $20 billion in debt and about $4 billion in assets. And when the oil price uh, went down and the price of copper went down, all of a sudden, you know, the stock went from forty dollars to, to three dollars. You know, all of the equity essentially got wiped out. So there's capital structure risk, and there's also liquidity risk. With an individual issue, you just simply don't have the liquidity that you have in the S and P 500. So a lot of people, they, while well, well, it may be very interesting to invest in stocks. You know, if you really want to invest to save your money, uh, a better avenue for that would be the S&P 500. And the S&P 500 is a pretty good way to make money in the long term. Uh, since the SPY, the S&P 500 ETF was launched in 1993, 80% uh, of the time the SPY delivers positive returns. And the average return is about 18%. Uh, 20% of the time, it gives you negative returns, and about, you know, 20% you, you lose in a given year. But if you look at it since 1993, which is over 20 years, you've had only four negative years. You have 2000, uh, 2001, 2002, and 2008. And, you know, we, we still talk about the Great Recession, but the reality of it is, is that there was only one negative year. Uh, during the financial recession. So this, this, the S&P 500 is a very li reliable way uh, to make money in a longer term. Um, why is that? Uh, why does the market keep going up all the time? There is various reasons for that. Uh, there is population growth in the United States. Uh, there is productivity uh, growth. So uh, when you combine more customers and better productivity, companies earn more money. Um, you know, there, there, you know, the American economy and the American companies are very innovative. They introduce new ways to make money and to optimize uh, the ways to make money. To you know, the, 
they invent new ways to boost profit margins. And in addition to everything that goes on in the companies themselves, there's also um, help from monetary policy and from fiscal policy. So uh, the Fed uh, will enact policies to help the stock market and um, the government may you know, borrow money to, to stimulate the economy and, and thereby stimulate corporate activity in the United States. So there is there's a, a lot of reasons why the S&P 500 goes in the long term, and those reasons are not going to change um, anytime soon. Um, so the S&P 500 is a great instrument, right? It goes up most of the time, but still, you know, most of us feels that we could do a little bit better, right? If you look at the uh, bear markets uh, in the aftermath of the tech bubble, uh, the S&P 500 lost about 50% from big to throw, and uh, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, the S&P 500 lost about 50% again from big to throw, uh, albeit in a shorter period of time. So if you look at it, you know, if you could kind of invest your money here, right, and sell somewhere as things are starting to go down, um, and then kind of get back in once things start to improve and ride the wave up for a few years until uh, things start to get bad again, you know, get out and then uh, wait it out through the downturn and then buy again as things are going up, you would make a lot of money in excess of what uh, what the S&P 500 itself would do, right? If the S&P 500, if you started here with $100,000, let's say it doubled up, it went to 200000 and then if you stayed invested in a buy and hold strategy, you went down to 100000 then back to 200000 back to 100000 back to 200000 and maybe you end up with, um, you know, $250,000 a little bit later. If you could just avoid these drawdowns, you could go from 100 to 200000 from 200,000 to 400,000, right? And from 400,000 all the way up to 800,000. So you can dramatically outperform the S&P 500 by and hold approach just by being smart about when you get in and when you get out. There is a lot of notions out there. There's a lot of misinformation spread about whether you can time the market and most of the professional uh, financial industry tells you that you cannot time the market, that you should just buy and hold. Uh, this is not true. Yes, you can time the market, and you can time the market uh, using volatility. And this is the purpose of our site, where we try to teach you how to time the market using volatility and uh, be able to outperform the market simply by knowing when to be in the market and when to be out of the market. So let's talk about volatility. What is volatility. Um, if you look at the market, the market is a, a tug of war between the bulls and the bears. There are investors that want to push the price up, that buy it, and there's investors that short the market and want to push the price down to bears, right? So, <coughs> as this tug of war develops, the bulls are more, are stronger, let's say, and the rope starts to go in this direction, right? But at some point, the prices become very expensive, or for whatever reasons, one of the bulls drops out of the bull team. What happens at that moment, there is a slight jerk. As the rope is moving up this way, all of a sudden there is a slight jerk. There is a slight jerk. Both the bulls and the bears sense that, and they stage another stand. You know, the bulls start to pull harder, the bears start to pull harder, right, and then the, the, this person who dropped off the team, you know, may decide to rejoin, but at some point he may decide to switch the teams and go over to the other side. And this initial jerk kind of foretells when people start to get off the bull team and start to switch sides. So this jerk is volatility, and volatility enables you to measure changes in the market sentiment early, early on. Most trading techniques nowadays, they focus on trend. Uh, you know, people calculate the moving averages, they calculate the Bollinger and Bands, so a trend following technique, for example, would only invest in the market if you're above a certain average, and then you ride the wave up. Uh, mean reversion techniques would calculate the Bollinger Band, which is 
one or two standard deviations below the moving average and then if price goes below uh, the Bollinger Band then you would buy it and you make a bet that the price will reverse to the mean which usually happens. In any case most of the trading techniques nowadays focus on price and its trend. If you add volatility to the picture you get to know when trends actually the reverse. This is the bane of trend following techniques, of trend based techniques because you don't know when the trend will reverse so you may get caught uh, in a wrong position. Vol by adding volatility analysis uh, to your trading techniques you can detect early on when sentiment changes and when trend changes and volatility really is the missing ingredient uh, to your trading so if you add it you will be able to do better how do we measure volatility um, I'm going to discuss briefly the standard measures of volatility and then I'm going to talk about the VIX which is the primary purpose of the site uh, standard measures of volatility if you have gone through college and have taken a statistics 101 course you know they've taught you about the normal distribution uh, the normal curve you know they've told you about the mean how all the values you know you can calculate the mean and then you can calculate the standard deviation and then all the values are you know 68 percent of the values are within one standard deviation of the mean and then 95 percent are within three standard deviations but most uh, distributions in real life they're not exactly normal like this they are sometimes skewed right so th the data can be skewed uh, positively or can be skewed negatively this is measured by a statistic called uh, uh, skewness and then also the curve sometimes can be bunched around the mean and the curve can be kind of higher and very thin or it can be very flat and spread out uh, this is measured with a statistic called kurtosis. Uh, we're not going to go into them, but these are the general terms, uh, the general ways to measure volatility, and they are in fact being used quite heavily in the financial industry. What we're going to focus here is the more standard measurements of, of volatility, and there's two measurements of volatility. There is so-called realized volatility, something that has happened in the past, and there's also uh, future volatility, uh, volatility that we expect to happen in the future. So common measures for realized volatility is uh, historical volatility or HV and that is really the annualized standard deviation of returns. So you take the returns of the S&P 500 over the daily returns of the S&P 500 over a certain number of days and then you run it through this formula and then you get what the historical volatility is. Uh, so usually it's measured in terms such as HV5, HV10, HV20, uh, you know, historical volatility for five days, trading days for a week, for 10 trading days for two weeks, for 20 trading days for one month, etc. Another measure of realized volatility is the average true range or ATR, which measures the average of the absolute daily returns so this in a way measures kind of the mean of the returns so uh, it's another very commonly used measure and people use it to define their stop levels so for example if something starts to move uh, outside of the usual uh, ATR range that means that something is afoot and people may decide to get out of the position because they don't know what's going on uh, measures of future volatility are implied volatility and expected volatility. Let's talk about briefly about implied volatility. This is a term used in the options world, uh, more specifically the Black and Scholes formula, where the Black and Scholes formula assumes constant volatility. So by plugging that in, you can calculate what the option price should be. Um, and this is a significant deficiency to the formula that it assumes constant volatility because that is not what happens in real life. In real life the volatility curve is very skewed and this is what the VIX methodology does. It, it assumes this skewed distribution of volatility and that's why it has become 
so popular and so widely used because it reflects reality better. Um, the S&P uh, the, um, <coughs> the S&P 500 volatility index, the VIX, was created in 1993 by Robert Whaley. This is the guy that created the VIX, and it measures the expected volatility of the S&P 500. Um, the VIX is calculated off of SPX option series. Um, it's calculated off of calls and puts on the SPX, the front and the back month, and it takes options between 23 and 37 days to expiration. And it, it, it you know there's a formula which calculates the weighted sum of all the option prices, and it gives you the VIX. And the VIX itself represents uh, one standard deviation of volatility. So for example. Uh, if you have a VIX of 15, what that means is that there's a 68% chance, you know, 70% chance that the S&P 500 will move 15% in the next year, right? It could move down or it could move up, but it tells you that it's going to move about 15% throughout the year. So you can take that information and actually reduce it down to a daily move, uh, and that's what gives rise to the rule of 16, a commonly referred rule of 16, which says that if the VIX is 16, that means that the S&P 500 will move 1% in the next three days. It could be up, it could be down, but you know that it's going to move uh, 1%. So the VIX is very widely used, and what, what, you know the question is, you know, what moves the VIX? Why does the VIX go up when the market goes down? And the reason is very simple. Most institutional investors, most professional money managers, they hold a portfolio of stocks, of S&P 500 stocks, because they get uh, dividends from them. And uh, they really don't want to sell the stocks. I, I, if they sense, if they decide that market sentiment will change and the market is going to start going down, they really don't want to sell their stocks because they get pretty good dividends. So what they want to do is they want to protect their, the principal, the invested principal, by purchasing put options. So usually they can do that at a fraction of the cost of the entire portfolio, but effectively be able to protect the entire portfolio as it goes down. So that's what puts allow you to do. So the VIX essentially captures that activity when institutional managers decide to buy puts. And puts are really the predominant option contract that's being bought for the SPX. So when the VIX starts to go up, essentially what it means is that people are panicking and they're buying puts and they're protecting their portfolio. So that's why the VIX goes up when the market goes down. You, you could have a VIX that goes up when the market goes up, and that actually happened in uh, between 98 and 2000 when uh, stock valuations became really expensive. Uh, and the market essentially didn't believe the valuations and people constantly were buying puts to protect even as, as prices were going up. So, so it is possible that the VIX goes up um, when the market goes up. I, you know, I haven't looked at the numbers, but you, you could have potentially a lot of calls. So the VIX can go up out of a lot of call activity, but that's generally not the case. You know, essentially 100% of the time, most of the time the VIX goes up because people buy puts to protect portfolios. So as such, the, the VIX is an inverse to the stock market. When the market goes down, the VIX goes up, and when the market goes up, the VIX goes down. That's the general uh, rule. The CBOE uh, does not provide just the VIX. The VIX is really a measure of 30-day uh, volatility. Uh, they also have other measures that use the same formula to calculate over different terms or different time frames. So the VX60 is a 9 day measure, uh, the VXV is a 90 day or 3 month measure, the VXMT is a 180 day or 6 month measure, and the VVIX is the VIX of the VIX, is a VIX of, um, you know, it's volatility of the VIX itself, and that is over a 30 day period, over a 1 month period. The CBOS provides VIX-like instrument for other asset classes, such as oil, there is the OVX, uh, there is GVZ, which is the gold VIX, uh, there is Thai VIX, which is 10-year treasury VIX, 
uh, there is even VIX for uh, Apple stock, uh, VX Apple, but those instruments are not widely used, they're not as widely quoted, and they're not as relevant as the VIX itself. I'm not going to discuss them uh, here in detail, I just wanted to know about them. Um, so the VIX is not only an index that you can track, but it also can be traded. So there's two markets where you can trade the VIX. There's the VIX futures market and there's the VIX options market. The VIX itself is a calculation, you cannot trade it directly, but people at some point wanted to trade the VIX and that's when the VIX futures market was created in 2004, over 12 years ago. Um, it's traded in the Chicago Futures Exchange, the ticker is VX, and the notional value of a contract there is about 100 times the VIX, which is a $20,000 contract, and the daily volume is about 200,000 contracts per day. So the daily notional volume is about 40 billion per day. So as you can see, this is a pretty deep market, and pretty widely used market, far in excess of Apple, for example. Uh, VIX futures usage has increased dramatically since 2010, as you can see, and uh, usage becomes bigger and bigger by the day. The VIX options market allows you to trade options on the VIX. Uh, this market was created in 2006. Uh, it's on the Chicago Board Options Exchange. The notional value is 100 times the VIX, so about $2,000 per contract. It's a far smaller contract and um, even retail investors can trade it. The daily volume is about 650,000 contracts per day and the total notional volume is about 1.3 billion per day. So of all the markets that we have discussed so far, this is by far the smallest market, but it's still pretty big. It's still on par with a um, GE or Bank of America in terms of daily notional volume. But in terms of all the other markets that we have discussed, it's by far the most inconsequential question, and it, it's not a subject of our site yet because of that. You can also trade volatility using volatility ETFs. Uh, there has been ETFs created uh, to enable retail investors to invest in a VIX because due to the size of the contracts, you know, you need to be an institutional investor to uh, institutional investor to invest in them. So at some point they created ETFs to enable retail investors to invest. Uh, what these volatility ETFs contain is they contain VIX futures. So um, while the institutions you know, trade the options in the futures market, retail can trade the ETFs. But the ETFs themselves contain VIX futures, which are traded by institutions. So this is something that you need to be aware of. Um, what is inside the volatility ETFs? That's what somebody asked me. Wh what do I hold? You know, when people buy a stock, uh, you know, they buy a natural gas pipeline or something, they can kind of understand what they hold. So what, what, is exactly, what exactly do you hold when you buy a volatility ETF? Well, you hold VIX futures, right? There's no actual backing. You, you're holding a derivative, um, the most sophisticated derivative nowadays, but you are holding a derivative. And what the most popular volatility ETFs contain is uh, the front and the back mod futures. Uh, in the VIX futures market, uh, the, the first two contracts, VX1 and VX2, and usually they hold a, uh, VIX futures with a constant maturity of 30 days. So, so effectively, the compositions of the ETF changes changes every day, and they would sell one future, they would sell the front one future, they would buy the back one future in order to keep the constant maturity uh, constant. So, a long volatility ETF would effectively every day buy a little bit of the back moon future and every day sell a little bit of the front moon future and a short volatility ETF would short the back moon future a little bit every day and cover uh, the front moon future contract a little bit every day so I if the VIX futures curve looks like this as for a long period of time let's say it's constant over a month or two and if there is a difference between the front and the back mount contracts, as you can see, there's automatically money to be made if you are on the short side of this, if you're shorting volatility. Um, this, because you're shorting here and you're covering here, you actually make money. And if you're long, the ETF 
you would be buying here and selling here at a lower price, you would be automatically losing a certain amount of money per day. So this is something to be aware of and this is going to be discussed in more detail in the next video. Um, for the purposes of this introduction though, it's important to realize that the volatility ETFs represent probably the most sophisticated derivative product out there uh, and probably the most stable derivative product out there simply because uh, the SPX future market is gigantic, it's 150 billion. The SPX option market where the VIX is calculated out of is a $170 billion market. And then the VIX futures market itself is a $40 billion market. So if you combine them all together, this is $360 billion traded daily. So, so if this infrastructure somehow fails, we have much bigger problems. It is very unlikely that this structure will fail. And in fact, this structure has been around for, for at least a decade. The, the futures market has been, long, uh, has been around for even longer than that. So it is very unlikely that you're going to have some kind of a catastrophic risk here. Um, uh, you know, there is some misinformation about that the, the volatility can break down very quickly or they can go bankrupt. This is uh, not the case. They are they're, they're fairly safe, you understand what you're doing, they're safer than a lot of stocks. And in fact, the, the, the AOM in volatility ETFs, the volatility is about $4 billion, which is far bigger than some individual, gigantic individual companies such as General Electric. Um, the volatility ETFs are, the major volatility ETFs are the following. Um, you have the XAV and the SV, uh, SVXE. These are short volatility ETFs. They uh, intend to track the VIX, um, you know, minus one of the VIX. And their AOM is about one to two billion dollars. Then you have the VXX and the VIXI, which are long volatility ETFs. They try to track the VIX on the positive side, you know, plus one VIX. They have about 500 million to one billion in AOM. Then you have the UVIXI and the TVIX, which are leveraged, two times leveraged long volatility ETFs. They try to double up on the, on the VIX itself. Um, there's also other volatility ETFs. Uh, there's quite a few nowadays, but most of them have a hundred, uh, less than a hundred million AUM, and I would really um, advise you to stay away from ETFs without uh, big liquidity, uh, simply because, you know, there's not enough liquidity, and if other people are not using them, there's probably a good reason. They probably have some deficiencies that you don't understand. Uh, so you generally should stay away from ETFs that are not uh, widely used. Uh, sometimes I'm asked why trade volatility. It's important to understand that price stability is a core mandate of the central banks and of the Federal Reserve. Central banks enact policies to control volatility in all asset classes, not only consumer price inflation, but also financial assets such as stocks and bonds. They have expanded their mandate over the years because they have uh, found out that if uh, prices of stocks and bonds go down, the general wealth of the nation goes down and that leads to unemployment and, um, you know, reduction in economic activity. So they, they would actually enact policies aimed at suppressing downside volatility in the markets, right? So in an ideal world for the Fed, um, asset prices are fairly stable. You know, they, they may have some acceptable levels of volatility, but ideally they don't move too much, and ideally they rise slowly over time. By trading the volatility ETFs, you get to trade central bank policy directly. This is the purest form in which you can trade that concept, you know, the, the, the fact that central banks uh, would intervene in the, mar in the market to suppress volatility. And if you look at uh, the volatility ETF performance, uh, you would find, you know, the XAV, the short volatility ETF, did really well in 2012 and 2013. In 2012 it made 154% and in 2013 it made 100%. Why? Because in 2012 and 2013 is when the Fed enacted QE in infinity with the overt purpose of su suppressing financial 
volatility. They just wanted to kill volatility in ETF, and markets responded accordingly. They, you know, enacted extraordinary measures. The markets responded uh, accordingly, and volatility uh, was measured by the VIX went down uh, and stayed down for a long period of time during uh, Q in infinity. After Q in infinity finishes, you can see the short volatility ETF didn't do so well. Um, but you know, if you if you know that the central banks uh, are doing things to tamp down volatility, this allows you to trade this directly and allows you to g get return in excess of that of the market, as you can see here, you know, 150 percent and 100 percent uh, in those two years. So it's important to understand uh, how volatility ETFs kind of work. They're tied to the S&P 500, but not really. They're also tied to the VIX. But not really. They don't give you a one-to-one -one exposure to the VIX simply because they are composed of VIX futures, and then there's that um, futures rollover inside of the volatility ETFs. Um, uh, as a result, the long volatility ETF, the VXX, is a massive dog because it constantly lose money. Um, so, so a lot of people think that they, they can use the VXX as a hedge, and that is true for very limited time periods. Majority of the time, the VXX simply loses money because of the shape of the VIX futures curve and you really need to be aware of that you, you can lose a lot of money in the VXX I mean if you invested in it when it was founded in 2009 you know if you invested a million dollar you probably have one dollar now so, so you lost everything so you really need to be careful when you use the VXX as a hedge I, I would actually say that it's not a good hedge right um, the, the reason is because volatility beats to its own drum right um, <coughs> so the general rule is a short volatility ETF can be an outstanding performer in an uptrending market and in flat markets, uh, but it also can, can lose money in a flat market. It really depends on how uh, price activity uh, performs during that time. You know, if you have a flat market and the price is fairly stable, a straight line, the short volatility ETF will do really well. However, if the market is flat but there is a lot of volatility, it goes up and down a lot, the short ETF the short volatility ETF is not going to do so well. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind. In terms of the long volatility ETF, it does bad in all markets. It does bad in, a, in an uptrending market. It does badly in a flat market. And surprisingly, it does not do so well uh, in a bear market as well. I mean, there are certain periods of time when it has really done really well, but there are fairly limited time periods. We're going to discuss that more in the next video. Uh, the general point I'm trying to make is that Buy and hold does not work for volatility ETFs. There are some people that spread misinformation about them that you can just buy and hold them and uh, they're the perfect instrument. They'll just keep making you money. That's not the case. Uh, they did really well during Q and Infinity. That's because central banks tried to suppress volatility. So they worked then. They did not work subsequently. So you must have a timing strategy. You must know when to get in and when to get out of the volatility ETFs. And if you do that, uh, you can achieve great returns in excess of uh, the market. You can es effectively beat the market without uh, doing, you know, individual comp company research and you know doing all that extra work to beat the market. You can actually beat the market by uh, being in and out of the market at the right time and being in and out of the volatility ETFs at the right time. So in a sense, you can generate alpha. That's the professional term for that. You can generate alpha by strictly being a, a beta investor and being a good market timer. In the next video, we're going to discuss how to time the market using volatility. We're going to go into more detail about that. And we're also going to discuss how we can trade volatility ETFs for profit.